Hi, this is Dr. Kevin Kirby coming again from Northern California. This mini lecture today is going to be on spring mechanisms within the foot and lower extremity. First of all, what is a spring? Well, a spring is an elastic structure. It's flexible and it's used to store mechanical energy. It can be made of a variety of materials, but any, any elastic material will suffice. Typically, they're metallic. Many types of springs, there's compression springs, such as the steel coil spring shown here, leaf springs here in the rear axle of a truck, spiral torsion springs are used in clock mechanisms, and springs of more unusual variety, such as the English longbow, in which the mechanical injury is stored within the wooden bow of the bow used for a bow and arrow. When we start talking about springs, we have to first mention this very important person back in the 17th century. He was an experimental scientist from Britain named Robert Hooke. Robert Hooke came up with the idea through experimentation, found that a law called Hooke's law that means that the amount of spring deformation in a spring, X, is gonna be directly proportional to the amount of the deformant force, F, in the spring, with the equation being F equals KX. K refers to the spring constant or the stiffness of the spring measured in newtons per meter. So here we have a spring that's unloaded. We add one weight, it deforms X. Two weights deforms two X. So Hooke's law F equals KX refers to the fact that this spring deformation is directly proportional to the force deforming it. Elastic materials, whether they're steel springs or tendons or ligaments in the body, will obey Hooke's law under relatively low loads and low deformations. So when we look at a graph of a steel spring, we can see that as long as we keep the loads on that spring fairly low, we're gonna be having a nice straight curve the slope of this graph is gonna be the stiffness of that spring. So when we have, we calculate out the slope, we can say that's the stiffness and that's gonna be the K value in Hooke's law. This linearly elastic region is also known as the Hookean region of the graph. It's gonna be the area where it is elastic. And when we say something as Hookean behavior, it means that the uh, displacement and the applied force to that material are going to be proportional to each other. When you look at the stress strain curve of a biologic material, such as a ligament or tendon, the stress strain curve is such that under low loads, it's going to have the, it's a linear or elastic region, and under higher loads, it has its plastic region. In addition, first of all, we can take this low load region, the elastic region or linear region, or also the Hookean region we can calculate the slope, and that will be the stiffness of that material in that low load region. At low loads also, we are gonna have this elastic behavior where when the tissue, including a tendon or ligament, is first loaded and then unloaded, and then unloaded and unloaded time after time, as long as the loads are below this proportional limit or elastic limit, the material, whether it's a tendon or ligament or bone or cartilage or fascia, will return back to its original shape. However, if we have high loads in the plastic region, this is going to produce the ligament rupture, tendon rupture, fracture of a bone, cartilage tear, etc. Also, we know from our last lecture on viscoelasticity that bone, tendon, ligament, fascia, skin, cartilage, they all are viscoelastic structures that exhibit time-dependent behaviors. Strain rate dependence, creep response, and stress relaxation are, are all very important time-dependent characteristics of these viscoelastic structures within our bodies. Here we have the Maxwell viscoelastic model. Again, we have a spring mechanism in series with a dash pot or viscous element to show the, not only the spring-like characteristic of these viscoelastic materials, but also its fluid nature 
that shows time dependent characteristics. Again, creep response is shown here. Stress relaxation response is shown on the right. These are all time dependent behaviors of these viscoelastic materials within our body. So as our bodies are loaded and unloaded thousands times a day, such as during walking when we take 10,000 steps in a day, we are going to be having these structures, whether ligaments or tendons or bone or fascia or skin or tendon or muscle being deformed and then returning back to its original shape as long as the loads are kept low and these tissues remain in their elastic region. So when we start talking about the springs within the foot of large extremity, we have to understand how this term elastic strain energy comes into play. Elastic strain energy is not just present in ligaments and tendons and muscles and fascia, but also present in many other structures such as a bouncing ball. So when we look at a ball that's dropped from a shelf, it accelerates toward the ground under the influence of gravity. It reaches its maximum velocity with the highest amount of kinetic energy just as it hits the ground. It will then compress and store this elastic strain energy and that's going to be a potential energy. And as it rebounds back to its regular shape, that elastic strain energy allows it to rebound back up away from the ground. So first it accelerates downward, maximizes kinetic energy, causes the ball to compress, and this elastic strain energy that is stored during the ball compression is then released, allowing it to recoil back. And this is how elastic strain energy is used in a bouncing ball and can be used as a mechanical analogy of many other types of activities that we do as humans and animals during our daily activities, such as running, jumping, and hopping. When we start talking about muscle springs, we have to look back into the late 19th century and early 20th century to Archibald V. Hill, or A.V. Hill, who was a British physiologist who pioneered muscle research and actually has a muscle model named after him, Hill's Muscle Model. And this is the Hill's Muscle Model where we have a contractor element, which would re represent the actin and myosin filaments moving on each other. We have the series elastic component, which is going to be the tendons attaching to the end of the muscle. And then we also are going to have a parallel elastic component to fulfill this Hill's muscle model, which are going to be the membranes around the actin and myosin filaments and also the elastic recoil within the actin and myosin uh, components that provide an elastic resistance to uh, stretching. So these muscle elastic elements can help amplify muscle power. They can reduce strain in the muscle during rapid deceleratory movements. And they can also improve the mechanical efficiency of running and hopping and galloping in other animals. Many animals also use this elastic strain energy to help improve the efficiency of locomotion and increase the power of locomotion. Here we have a horse galloping at about 50 miles an hour. And here we have the world's greatest sprinter, Usain Bolt running at approximately 28 miles per hour. We can see that both the horse and the human being are using elastic strain energy within their limbs in order to increase the efficiency and the power of their running, jumping, galloping activities in order to both store energy, release that energy, and in so doing, making the activity more efficient metabolically and also increasing the power of that activity. Kangaroos and wallabies are some of the prime examples of animals that can use this storage and release of elastic strain energy in their tendons in order to improve their efficiency. In fact, both kangaroos and wallabies are able to jump faster and faster with very low expenditure of metabolic energy for muscle power due to the fact that their long tendons in their legs are able to store and release a significant amount of elastic strain energy with each hop in order to produce the effects of increased hopping uh, speed and velocity. 
Can we look at the human bipedal animal that uses running as a form of faster locomotion to get from point A to point B? We have modeled in the scientific literature the spring mass model. This was first postulated by Blickham over 30 years ago. And what it involves is a mass position over a spring. So the mass is going to be our center of mass over our leg spring. And as it hits the ground, the spring compresses. Then as the center of mass moves forward, it releases, producing the next running step. This is very similar in mechanism to the balancing ball I showed you earlier, where we have a storage of potential energy in the spring as it compresses and a release as kinetic energy to go to the next step. So this leg spring that we have in our bodies due to the storage of elastic strain energy, not only within this series, but also the parallel elastic elements within our muscles and tendons, uh, allows us to run more efficiently with more power and better metabolic uh, use of energy. Here we have another model showing the energy storage during the first half of support phase where the spring compresses and the energy released during the second half of support phase of running where the energy is released and the leg spring extends to show how the spring mass model allows us to explain how energy is exchanged between potential energy and kinetic energy with each running step, very similar to the way a child on a pogo stick is able to hop from down the street on his pogo stick, utilizing the storage and then release of this elastic strain energy. So very important to understand that the spring mechanism within the fetal extremity allows us to run more efficiently metabolically and to have more power and have more speed to allow us to run efficiently and without injury. Other spring mechanisms in the foot are related to the ligaments, which are non-contractile elements. They're passive elements, but they also have stretch in them to allow the uh, storage and release of elastic strain energy. The classic experiment showing this was that done by Kerr, where they took a foot and put it into a load cell with a steel block under the heel and underneath the forefoot with brass rollers, and then an actuator underneath that would simulate the running motions. So they took and moved this actuator up and down and up and down and measured the amount of load that the movements of this foot to stretch the arch ligaments produced and how much energy was stored with each actuator movement. They estimated for a hundred joules of energy was stored and released for a approximating a 70 kilogram man or approximately 154 pounds during each running foot strike. And that 17 joules of that energy was stored in the compliant elements of the arch, including the ligaments and the plantar fascia. And that approximately 35 joules of energy was stored with each step in the Achilles tendon. So the conclusion from their 1980 study was that the compliant elements within the arch of the foot, including the plantar fascia and plantar ligaments, stored enough elastic strain energy to make running more efficient. The mid-tarsal joint, midfoot joints, and the metatarsal rays are also spring-like mechanisms. When we start looking at a foot that's being loaded on the forefoot by a ground reaction force, and we load it up more and then more, we see that we have the spring-like mechanism within the plantar ligaments and plantar fascia and the muscles that come into the arch, such as the flexor digitorum longus, flexor lucis longus, posterior tibial and perineus longus, all of these muscles and these stretchy elements within the tendons of these uh, muscles and the ligaments allows the foot to absorb energy and store energy when it's loaded and then will release that energy as kinetic energy as the load is reduced. So this is another spring-like mechanism, and this is within the ligaments and tendons of the human foot, so that as we have more metatarsal head force, we are gonna get more dorsiflexion, and less metatarsal head force, we're gonna get less dorsiflexion. So this, again, brings us back to this idea of stiffness, is that if we have a more stiff or less compliant metatarsal ray, it's going to tend to move less for a given force, 
than if we had a more compliant or less stiff metatarsal array. This is important because we need to understand that we've not always walked on flat surfaces. Our ancestors walked on uneven surfaces. So that instead of a flat surface where all the metatarsal rays are getting approximately equal loads, we may have a situation where we have a varus cant to the surface or a concave cant to the surface or a convex cant to the surface. And all of these will create different loading patterns of metatarsals. And we need all of our metatarsals to be able to have variable stiffness to them the ability to spring back into shape or spring away out of the way in order to keep the forefoot plantigrade. So when we walk on irregular or sloped or curved surfaces, having these spring-like mechanisms within the human foot and in the metatarsal radius and the midfoot joints and also the metatarsal joint, that we have these spring-like mechanisms within these joints and metatarsal radius in order to allow us to maintain our foot in a plantar period position so that we can adapt to not only regular services, but also we can do activities that are not just straight ahead activities such as running or walking. So for example, when we have a uneven surface, the foot cannot function optimally on the regular ground unless we have a spring-like mechanism within the foot. And we don't really want to have the mid-tarsal joint locked in a certain position. We want to have a spring-like mid-tarsal joint and mid-foot joint metatarsal ray in order to keep our foot plantigrade. And also when we do movements on the ground that are side-to-side -side movements, such as in side-to-side -side sports or walking up a slope or running on a side slope, we need to have those spring-like mechanisms within our foot to allow the metatarsal rays for the plantar forefoot to stay on the ground to maintain stability of the foot and to optimize our weight bearing activities. So in summary, the foot and the lower extremity has multiple springs within it. Hooke's law, F equals KX, means that springs, whether they're steel springs or the springs within our foot lower extremity will exert a force proportional to the deformation of that spring that the spring-like tissues within the foot lower extremity are able to both store and release energy using elastic strain energy in order to improve the mechanical efficiency of running, jumping, and also hopping activities. And the spring-like ligaments within the foot lower extremity, in addition to the long tendons coming from the leg, allows our foot to be able to adapt to terrain, do side-to-side -side activities, and to keep our forefoot plantigrade on the ground they are not locking mechanisms as we've been taught many years in the podiatry profession, but rather the spring-like mechanisms are important to allow our foot to function optimally in all the weight-bearing activities we must do in our daily lives. Thank you for your attention to the lecture and stay safe.